I want to ask you a question. If you could get rid of one thing in the world, what would that be? Anybody got a quick answer for that? Oh, well, I hear them all over the place, yeah. <laughs> I won't ask you to repeat them, but probably something came to your mind immediately as soon as I said that. As Pastor Ted was reading several responses to that question online, and to that answer, several people gave the name of one politician or another that they didn't particularly like. One person said they would get rid of the designated hitter rule because they believe the pitchers ought to bat. A couple of people said they would get rid of mosquitoes. Somebody said they would get rid of bed bugs. The one that caught my eye was the person who said, I, I believe we should delete human intelligence, and this is how they spelled it. Yeah, I was waiting for the left. <laughs> Jan corrected it. <laughs> Teacher couldn't stand it. She thought I made a mistake. You messed up my joke, Jan. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, that's not working. All right. You want to switch that out there while I'm talking? Yeah, we're going to um, switch this out here, but... They spelled, uh, they spelled intelligence with an A after the two L's, and so I thought that was really funny, you know, get rid of human intelligence. and Yeah, but anyway, among the, um, among the more serious answers that were given, one person said they would get rid of cancer. Boy, I'm sure a lot of us would like to get rid of that. Corruption, poverty, bigotry, racism war, violence, and pain. Uh, one of the most frequent answers was religion, as many people see that as the, the source of most of the conflict that's in the world. And uh, in regards to conflict, according to the Geneva Academy, there are currently at least 114 armed conflicts going on in the world right now. Uh, the ones that we hear the most about are the Russian invasion of the country of Ukraine, where those people are still fighting for their lives, and the terrorist invasion by Hamas, which kicked off the current conflict that we have in Gaza right now with the people of Israel. And then there's hunger. A lot of people in this world are hungry. According to World Vision, there are at least 258 million people across 58 countries who have so little to eat that their lives or their livelihoods are in danger, just not being able to work because they're not strong enough to do so. If you want to talk about the environment, uh, the Amazon rainforest is being cleared at a rate of uh, what was it, 10 million hectares a year? Now that's down from the 16 million back in the 90s, but that can still be measured in acres per minute. It's kind of hard to wrap your mind around, but a study done by National Geographic Society said that there are 100 acres of rainforest being cleared every minute. So think about how much rainforest is going to be cleared by the time that we end this service today. And then there's slavery. Across the world, there are some 50 million people who are currently living in some form of human slavery, where people are taken and they're locked up and they're forced to work, forced to do things they don't want to do, and they can't go home. And this is in the year 2024. And very often these people are in plain sight, but they're hidden behind the veil of human trafficking. All that to say, I think if there's one thing that nearly everyone in the world would be able to agree upon is that things are not the way they're supposed to be. Whether you're a child or an adult, whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're an atheist or a Buddhist, a Marxist or a Muslim, a communist or a Christian, we can all see that this world is a messed up place. Now, as far as the reasons why it is messed up and the solutions that are offered for fixing it, well, those are as different as the people and the ideologies that they represent. But what the Word of God tells us 
is that the reason why this world is such a messed up place and that life is not what it is supposed to be is because people are not what they're supposed to be. The world is a messed up place because we are messed up people. And we can just see this all the way back from the book of Genesis when God created this perfect world for people to live in. And the first people that he created to live in this perfect world rebelled against him. And so it has gone on and on. And when we started this book of Isaiah a few weeks ago, we saw that it was still going on thousands of years later as the Lord was speaking to the people of Judah through the prophet Isaiah saying, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. Children I have reared and brought up, but they have rebelled against me. And here the Lord was speaking directly to the people of Israel but that would apply also to every nation of people in the whole world and every person who has ever lived because all of us have rebelled against God. Years later, the Apostle Paul said, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread on all men, for all have sinned. And he even says that creation itself was subjected to futility. And he says that the whole of, cre of creation is groaning as if in childbirth until now. And it's still going on today. I mean, even nature is messed up because of the effects of the sin of man here in the world. People do awful things and the world is still a messed up place. But if you'll turn with me in your Bibles this morning to Isaiah chapter 11, this morning we're going to see the Lord speaking through his prophet with a different message. And that message is that things aren't always going to be the way that they are here on this earth. And even though the people of Israel and the people of Judah had done some awful things and there was a terrible judgment that was about to fall upon them and, and they would continue to do awful things, what God was going to raise up one day a leader from this tribe of Judah who was going to make everything right with the world, and not only be able to save them, but to offer that same salvation to all the people from all the countries in the world, and even one day, put even nature and creation back to what it was supposed to be. And since this is such great news, why don't y'all stand with me this morning and read this wonderful promise that the Lord gives us in Isaiah chapter 11 as I read. In Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1, it says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like an ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. 
In that day, the root of Jesse, who shall stand as a signal for the peoples, of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. Let's just go to the Lord in a word of prayer as we begin. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, as we look around us and we see all the things that are messed up in the world, Lord, it can be overwhelming and it can be discouraging. But Father, we thank you for what you have told us in your word. And as we read it this morning, I pray that you will guide us in understanding it and in rejoicing in this wonderful truth that you tell us and in making sure that we belong to you so that we will be able to enjoy this world that is coming that you are preparing for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You all may be seated. The title of this message this morning is The Rule and the Resting Place of Jesus. And here in verse 1, the Lord describes him as a branch shooting out from the stump of a tree. He says, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And this is actually the second time that the Lord ha- that, that the Lord has spoken about this person who is coming in this way through the prophet Isaiah because after describing the judgment and the desolation and the ruin and the poverty and the sorrow that was going to come upon the nation of Judah because of their rebellion against the Lord in Isaiah chapter 4 and verse 2 he says, "In that day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious" And the fruit of the land shall be the pride and honor of the survivors of Israel. And here in chapter 11, he says that this branch will shoot from the stump of Jesse. Now, does anybody know who Jesse was? Who was Jesse? Larkin, you know? That's okay. Yeah. Yeah, Jesse was the father of David. And David was Israel's greatest king. And you can remember Probably, uh, if you may have learned this in Sunday school, how that one day the Lord sent his prophet Samuel on a mission after King Saul had messed up, and he told him, I want you to go and anoint somebody else to be king. And in 1 Samuel, he tells him, and he says, that I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite. For I have provided for myself a king from among his sons. And you know the story that that Jesse brought all of his sons there and he started with the oldest and Samuel thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed right here. And the Lord said, no, 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 don't look at how he looks on the outside for the Lord doesn't look on the outside, the Lord looks on the heart. And he goes through all of them and he says, don't you have any other sons left? And he says, well, just this one guy, he's just, but he's the youngest. He's out taking care of the sheep. He said, we're not going to do anything else until you go get him. And they bring David in, and they said, here, this is the Lord's anointed. And Samuel put that oil on his head, which signified that he was one day going to be king. And after David did become king, the Lord made him an amazing promise. He said, in your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. And many years later, after Isaiah, the Lord would speak through another prophet called Jeremiah, and he would say, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. And when Jeremiah wrote this, the armies of Babylon had surrounded Jerusalem. It was about to be destroyed. The temple was about to be burned. People were about to be slaughtered. The remnant was about to be carried away into captivity. And yet the Lord is saying, The stump is going to remain. The nation of Israel was going to be like a tree that was cut down, but the stump would remain. We saw that in Isaiah chapter 6 last week. And here he is saying that out of that stump was going to arise someone who would be the king 
whose kingdom would last forever. Any of y'all want to guess who that king might be? Hatcher? Did you raise your hand, Hatcher? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought your hand was up. Well, do you know what, you know what Gabriel told Mary when he came and gave her that announcement that she was going to give birth to a child? Listen to what he said. He said, and behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And, and listen to this. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of, the, and of his kingdom, there will be no end. Jesus is the branch that Isaiah and Jeremiah were talking about. He was the one who would shoot from this stump of the tribe of Jesse that seemed to have been cut off and destroyed. He would rise up, and one day, he is going to rule over the people of Israel. And not only over the people of Israel, but he's going to rule over the whole world. And just listen to the kind of person and the kind of ruler he is going to be as we look at the righteous rule that Jesus is going to have when he sets up his kingdom here on this earth. He says in, in verse 2, he says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. And you know, sometimes we'll have a ruler or a leader who will really, really want to do right, but they just don't have the power to do all the good things that they want to do. And sometimes we have somebody who has lots of power, but you know usually what happens when a human being has lots of power? You know the saying? Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. <laughs> Well, one day there's going to be a ruler who is not only going to be righteous and all righteous, but he's going to be all powerful and he's going to be able to do everything that's right because the spirit of the Lord will rest upon him in its fullness. And do you remember what Jesus told the people in Nazareth on the day that he went back to his hometown and began his ministry among them? He came to them and he said, what? The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, and, liber and set at liberty those who are oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus came to fix everything that's wrong with the world. Back then, there was suffering, there was slavery, there was war, there was oppression. There were all these bad things going on. But do you remember why this world is such a messed up place? It's because we are messed up people. And when Jesus began to proclaim that message to his people, they didn't want to hear that. Now, if you remember when Isaiah saw the Lord, when he saw King Jesus sitting on his throne high and lifted up, he knew right away, he said, I'm lost. I'm devastated. I'm undone. I'm destroyed because my eyes have seen the king. And you remember what the king did? He cleansed him from his sin. And Isaiah was so thrilled to be free from his sin that he couldn't wait to do whatever it was that the Lord told him to do. But when Jesus came to the people of Israel, did they want him to fix them? Did they want him to take their sin away? because they didn't really think they had any sin that needed taking away. When he spoke to them on that day, and he began to 
tell them these things that they needed to know about themselves. They tried to kill him by throwing, throwing him over a cliff. It wasn't his time to die yet. But one day he did die, and one day they did kill him when they handed him over to the Romans. The thing was, they didn't know, was that was all part of God's predetermined plan. Because even from eternity past, before God even made the world, he knew the people in the world were going to rebel against him. He knew all this bad stuff was going to happen. And from eternity past, God had already decided that his son was going to pay the price. That he was going to pay the price for all of the evil in the world by sacrificing himself and dying on a cross. So that God could raise him up from the dead in victory and save whoever believes in him. And after he rose from the dead, he sent his people out all over the world with that message. And one of them was called the Apostle Paul. And he put it this way. He now commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed the day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. By a man whom he has appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And this is what Isaiah is talking about here in chapter 11. He is talking about this king who will come from the household of Jesse, who will one day return as king and judge the world. And so when Jesus comes to judge the world, How's he going to do it? In Isaiah 11.3 it says, He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. I got called for jury duty this past week. As it turns out, I didn't have to go because they called later on in the evening and said they settled out of court. But when people go to court and they assemble a jury and there's a judge and there are attorneys, all that they can do is weigh the evidence that's there in front of them. What their eyes can see, what their ears can hear. They can listen to that and get the reports, and then they have to make a decision as to whether they believe that the person accused is guilty beyond any reasonable doubt or, or is innocent. And I know there are many, many wonderful, dedicated people who have given their lives for this purpose to see to it that our justice system is all that it can be. But I think... There's probably nobody here naive enough to believe that we always get it right 100% of the time. For one thing, how many people who have committed horrible crimes never even get caught? And then how many people who do get caught never get punished simply because they can hire the best lawyer or because of some technicality and the whole case gets thrown out? But it can cut the other way too. Because sometimes people who are innocent are actually found guilty and end up going to prison. And this has happened uh, quite a few times actually. And the National Registry of Exonerations said that in the year 2022, there were 253 people who had been found guilty and were sent to prison. And when later evidence was discovered that exonerated them or that made it plain, proved that they hadn't done the crime that they were accused of. And all told, since 1989, there have been 3,512 people who have been exonerated by later evidence that came out after they were sent to prison. And what that translates to is 31,900 years of life lost by people in prison for a crime that they didn't commit. And, and we want liberty and justice for all, and we do the very best that we can with it. But we don't always get it right. We have to judge by what our eyes can see, 
but our eyes don't see everything. We have to judge by what our ears hear, but our ears don't always hear everything. However, one day, when this person called the branch, the root of Jesse, when he comes, he's not going to have to judge by what his eyes see. He's not going to have to judge by what his ears hear because he has already seen and already known it all. And in fact, he even knows the thoughts and the intents and the motives of people's hearts for the things that they do and the reasons why they do them. He's going to know it all. And when he deals out justice, folks, it's going to be perfect justice. And the punishment is always going to fit the crime. In his kingdom, no swindler is ever going to get by with a credit card scam. There's no person who hurts women and children who will ever get off because of some technicality. And no person who has been treated unfairly for the color of their skin or any other reason is ever going to go unpunished because he's going to judge in righteousness because he is the Lord of righteousness. And he's the one who's going to be on the throne. With righteousness, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. The meek and the poor will finally get what they have coming to them. Justice and righteousness. But the wicked will also get what's coming to them too. Because it says this king is going to strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked. And yes, you heard that right. You might be thinking, well, that doesn't sound like the meek and lowly Jesus to me. My friend, the meek and lowly Jesus who came to this earth and said, and who still says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, is also the same Jesus who is one day going to say, depart from me, you cursed ones, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. It's the same Jesus. Make no mistake about it, when Jesus came the first time, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. But when he comes the second time, it's going to be to punish the lost who didn't want to be found. And it's really going to happen. And he says, righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. Jesus will rule in absolute righteousness and in absolute power. But not only is Jesus the king going to set all the people right, he's also going to set all of creation right as well. Look at what it says again in verse 6. It says, the wolf shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the young goat. And the calf and the lion and the fattened calf together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. When Jesus comes again and begins his rule on this earth, even the animal kingdom is going to be at peace. Wolves aren't going to eat little lambs anymore. Leopards aren't going to eat goats anymore. Lions aren't going to eat calves anymore. And a little child will be able to lead them. Do you think you would like to play with a lion? That sound cool? Play with a lion, a leopard, maybe get up there and ride on his back, grab hold of his mane, and it'll all be good. And this is the one that always gets me. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the cobra. And the weaned child shall put his hand on the adder's den. 
And when we were living in Ecuador, we had lots of snakes. We had a lot of them that were venomous snakes. We had coral snakes. We had fertile ants. We had bushmasters. I remember one day I was walking, all of us as a family, we were going down to the river from Rio Verde. And as we were walking down through uh, the edge of this field, this snake shot out in front of us. And I kid you not, he was every bit of 12 feet long and he was moving faster than any snake I'd ever seen. And he was at least that big around. I don't know what kind he was, but I stood there and he was just right, he just went right in front of us. And I said, oh God. Becky said, Mommy, why is daddy swearing? She said, he's not swearing, honey, he's praying. <laughs> I was, it was oh Lord. But can you just imagine mom and dad sitting there on the porch? Hey, where's Junior? Oh, he's over there playing by the cobra hole. He likes to watch him when he comes out. I mean, some of you have had to shoot snakes almost right, rattlesnakes right off your porch. Don't mess with Jamie, man. She's deadly with a nine millimeter. <laughs> but one day, kids will be able to play around the snake holes and it'll all be good because the snakes aren't going to hurt anybody. <laughs> it's they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's because Christ is the Lord of righteousness. But he's also the Lord of creation. He's also the same Lord by whom all things were created and by whom all things consist or hold together. And one day he is going to lift that curse. And even the animal kingdom is going to be at peace. And then Isaiah says, In that day the root of Jesse who shall stand as a signal or a standard for the peoples. Of him shall the nations inquire, and his resting place shall be glorious. What the Lord is saying here through Isaiah is that this branch, the root from Jesse's family, would one day be raised up like a banner that would draw people from all nations to him. And when Jesus returns at the end of that time called the Great Tribulation, all the people who are still alive on the earth, they're going to come to him. And in fact, in Zechariah, it says that, that, that they were going to be, there are going to be ten people from every nation who are going to grab the sleeve of the Jewish man and say, hey, you know, can you take us to him? We want to see. We've heard that the Lord is with you. And one day he'll be lifted up as king. When Jesus came the first time, he was lifted up, wasn't he? Remember what he told Nicodemus when he came to him that night? He said, even as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Later on, he said, if I am lifted up, I will draw all people to myself. And he said this to show what kind of death he was going to die. And Jesus was lifted up on a cross, bearing the weight of all of our shame, all of our guilt, all of our sin. But one day he's going to be lifted up again. Only it's not going to be in a shameful way, in a painful, agonizing way. He's going to be lifted up on the throne of his father David. And he's going to rule in righteousness. And as Jesus begins his reign here on the earth, people from all over the world are going to come to Jerusalem. And Isaiah says, his resting place will be glorious. I mentioned a minute ago that Jesus invites all people now to come to him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He wants to give us rest from our guilt. He wants to give us rest from our sin. He wants to give us rest from our worries and our fears. He wants to give us rest through trying to make it through this nasty old world all by ourselves. And one day, when he comes again, he's going to give us rest from this world itself. 
because everything is going to be right. In Isaiah 32, it says, Then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness abide in the fruitful field, and the effect of righteousness will be peace, and the result of righteousness, quietness and trust forever. My people will abide in a peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. Does that sound good to you this morning? Boy, that sounds good to me. Do you long for righteousness and justice? Then turn to the one who is the Lord of righteousness, who was lifted up to take your sins so that he could give you the righteousness of God in exchange. Do you want peace and quietness and trust? Then put your trust in the Prince of Peace who wants to give you a quiet, peaceful heart even in this world that is not what it is supposed to be. In this world, we're going to have trouble, to be sure. Jesus told us that. But you remember what he said next. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. He has overcome this world, and one day he's going to come and take claim to this world, and he's going to rule over it in righteousness and in peace. Friend, I don't know what all you're going through. But it's not going to last forever. One day, the Prince of Peace, the King of Righteousness, is going to come and set everything right. And his rule and his resting place will be glorious. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this wonderful, wonderful promise. This picture that you've painted of your kingdom that you will have when you come to this earth to rule. Lord, I pray for those of us who are already part of your kingdom that, Lord, we will live in anticipation and excitement, and hope. And that, Lord, you will use this to guard us from discouragement over all the bad stuff that we see going on in the world. Sometimes it can seem overwhelming. But Lord, as Kim shared in Sunday school class, the end of the story is you win. And because you win, we win. And that's the end of it, Lord. And we thank you that you have this quiet resting place waiting for us. And Lord, I pray that you will give us opportunity and you will cause us to be diligent in seeking opportunities to tell others about how that they can take part and how they can share in this wonderful resting place that you're preparing so that they won't have to hear those awful words, depart from me but instead we'll hear the words enter into the joy of the Lord. And God, may we be faithful in doing that, I pray in Jesus' name.